We write scripts that are disruptive. Let's get the conversations going. We need to write Ugandan stories for the world to see. Hello, my name is Nana Kaga, and I am a producer, a director. I'm a scriptwriter. Opportunities are here. A producer will make sure that the production in itself has financing, the right casting, the right end goal, and make sure that it makes money. So when I'm choosing crew, I like to consider loyalty, how long they've been doing things, the work they've done, their ambition and where they want to go. When I'm picking a script, I like to think, are we really generating conversations? Are we talking about who we are? As soon as you get a script, your locations are key because when we normally are creating a story. The environment is what brings it to life. So locations are what takes the viewer on the journey with you. To become a producer, it takes a lot of determination, a little madness to actually get stuff done. You have to have a belief in your production. Festivals are important on a producer's journey because most festivals have cash prizes. Those cash prizes as producers enable us to invest into other projects. They also get you noticed for co-productions and your work gets seen and you get celebrated. Festivals are a networking thing. Hello, my name is Nana Kaga and I am a producer, a director, I'm a scriptwriter. I'm also the co-owner of Savannah Moon Productions, which I own with my sister Meme Kaga. I am also a petroleum engineer, I'm a daughter, I'm a mother, and basically I'm a sister and a motivational speaker. And this is Opportunities Are Here. Oh, wow. Is that like the role of a producer in Uganda or globally? They differ. A producer in Uganda does everything. I would say it does everything. Um, globally, I think a producer puts together the bones of the entire production, uh, brings up the financing, um, basically is involved in the casting, the, uh, basically the end game of the product, where it's going. So globally, a producer will make sure that the production in itself has financing, the right casting, the right end goal, and making sure that it's run as smoothly as possible and make sure that it makes money and it makes sense and that everyone actually benefits from it. In Uganda, to become a producer, I think it takes a lot of determination. I'd also say a little madness to actually get stuff done here. I would also think that you have to have a belief in your production to the point where you don't see the obstacles. I'm not saying they're not there, but in this environment, the obstacles are many. A producer in Uganda is actually a fixer. I won't lie, you're a fixer, you do it all where a department is failing, you step in, you are involved in the casting, you're doing a lot of it. And also you are everyone's cheerleader because productions in Uganda are very difficult. The environment in itself is difficult in all aspects. So you do it all and you are, I would say the motivational speaker, the therapist, the doctor, that I could keep going, but I'm not. <laughs> Wow, um, every script that I have worked on as a producer, I have written. Simply because my vision of content in Uganda doesn't quite gel with other writers, I feel that we're stuck in a rut. As script writers in Uganda, we like to choose the safe topics. We like to choose tragedy. We like to choose witchcraft. We like to choose disease. We don't want to celebrate ourselves. And I find that scripts in Uganda always end up making us, I like to call it poverty porn. 
And that's a very, I, I prefer to call it that. I don't know what uh, everyone else calls it. But I think we are of the mindset that as long as we present ourselves tragically, people will gen basically come and see us. Instead of celebrating us, we prefer to talk about our problems, not who we are as a people, how strong we are as a people, how resilient we are as a people, how amazing uh, we have accomplished so much. No one wants to talk about the Kampala that where people actually spend and buy in cash, not on credit. So our depiction of ourselves is a little bit skewed from the Ugandan perspective. So as a producer, when I'm picking a script, I like to think, are we really generating conversations? Are we talking about who we are? The reflection of the characters on that screen, are they reflective of the demographic of people we want to present? And so what I do when I write, I make sure that I at least, whether the script is tragic or light or uplifting, that it b basically draws in the viewer and it gives a different perspective of how we are as a people. The key things I pay attention to when putting together my budgets are first of all my crew. They're the most under-celebrated um, part of a production. Because they're not in front of a camera, everyone assumes that they will work for whatever you give them. Being part of the crew and also being part of the cast is a key aspect of my life. Because my crew, I understand that they're the ones who work the long hours. They're the ones who actually put together the lighting, the sound, the set design, the wardrobe. They're the ones that work long hours while everyone else like the cast can be booked for one day or two days or three days. The crew works tirelessly. So my strongest point is my crew. Do I have the right crew? Beside the cat, then I go to the cast, of course, because casting is about, I would say, 60% of the production. When you have a strong cast, everything else can be brought together by how strong your cast is. So my crew, then my cast, and then, of course, they have to be paid, they have to be fed properly, and they have to feel like they're part of something worthwhile doing. So those are the things I consider my crew and my cast and, of course, the script. But everything else is supplementary. Everything else can be worked around. But those are the core things that I as Nana focus on. Before one chooses a crew, one needs to consider how long you've been with these people. Do they understand you? Do they, do they understand the environment you operate in? Do they understand what it takes to do what you do? Also, the longevity of how long your crew has been with you is crucial. But at the same point, you cannot ignore up and coming talent. So one needs to be very aware of who's doing what, who has done what by watching Ugandan content and at large East African content and at large African content. And if you have the budget, of course, you can go globally. But for me, I prefer to work with people that I know. And that should be a basis of how you deal with things. Because also, I mean, we all have dream people we would like to work with, but kindly consider your budget. One must not make promises financial promises that they cannot keep to a crew because what that does, they lose trust in someone. They basically will never come back. It doesn't matter how good your current project is. If you are not basically training your crew and giving them what they want, then you're basically training them for someone else. So when I'm choosing crew, I like to consider loyalty, I'd like to consider how long they've been doing things. I like to consider the work they've done. I like to consider their ambition and where they want to go. And I also want to understand why they're doing what they're doing, because then you can push them to deliver what you want them to deliver at the same time without them feeling that you're compromising their work. As a producer, you have to have a very good relationship with your cast and crew because they are your deliverers for the project. If your crew puts down their tools, 
your project is done. If your cast is unhappy, they cannot deliver what you want them to deliver. And many times we disregard the happiness of cast because we're like, you know what, they need the work. The misconception here is that they need us to give them work. But really good cast, really good cast, normally comes on board, not for financial reasons, but the belief they have in a producer or a director. As for crew, they're the people that are going to give you what you envision in your head. So it's very easy as a director to come up with a shot list. It's very easy to come up with a mood board. It's very easy to come up with this dream. But if you don't have the right people that hear you, that are loyal to you, that will go the extra mile to deliver that vision for you, then you're in trouble because it doesn't take much for someone to turn up to work. But what it does take is for someone to give you 500% when you're paying for 50%. So it's really important that you listen to your crew, that you understand what's driving them, and that you hear your cast. Um, it's very difficult when you're basically, as a producer, when you're dealing with finances, when you're dealing with a lot of things, like I said, in the Ugandan environment, you're a fixer, but one needs to multitask and really hear them and listen and do your best and explain when you cannot deliver specific things. As um, Ugandan filmmakers, we like to think things will fix themselves. We don't like the difficult conversations. Have those difficult conversations with your cast, have them with your crew, so that expectations are managed in pre-production, so that your production is not compromised on deliverables and timelines. The challenges I have ever faced as a team, wow. Um, lights. Does anyone ever, ever do with lights? This industry, like lighting in remote locations is, is a key challenge for me because as much as we want to create that African story, the exteriors, the beauty of African vegetation, you have to shoot it in the day. You cannot shoot it at night. So I find lighting, finding sources of lighting, finding generators, finding lights that don't go off, finding the perfect lighting person is a key challenge for me. So I just watched the black box and the lighting there is sexy. I can't even find another word for it. And I, I I wanted to recreate that on a project that I'm working with, but every single person I sent the mood board that's a gaffer was like, ha, ah, this is going to be extremely challenging. We can't recreate this. We don't have this. We don't have that. And the ones that actually had the capability to do it were out of my price range. So that's a key thing. There's also um, another challenge is um, understanding professionalism on set. Understanding that when you're hired to do a job, excuses are not good enough. And when you challenge people here on why they're not delivering what they promised, they tend to take it personally. They tend to think that you're being difficult. But when it's a high pressure environment, what you're asking someone to do is give you that extra mile so that all of you can actually deliver this whole thing cohesively. So that's another thing that I've also encountered. And here, I don't know if this will be um, taken the wrong way. I think we like celebrating mediocrity. That's something that I find here every time. When someone gives you just enough, they feel that they have delivered. And I, you know, educating someone that, you know, when your name goes on the credit, whatever went wrong on that project is your responsibility. It stops being the producer's responsibility. It's your responsibility. The understanding that when you sign on to do a job, it's actually your name attached to it. And if you win, you win. If you lose, you lose. But doing just enough never gets you hired again. That's something that I really, really struggle with. Uh, people just feeling that they'll just do enough. Also, I don't think we challenge ourselves enough to tell the difficult stories. By difficult stories, I don't mean the tragic stories. I, I, I'm talking about the emotional well-being of us as a society, the mental well-being of us as a society, what it takes for me as a woman 
as a Muganda woman Zengana what it takes to exist in today's world between the Western expectations and the culture expectations to actually write a script that will be re well received, that will be a topic for discussion. We like to skate over topics and it's really, really important that we write scripts that are disruptive. I, I like to say that word. We write scripts that are disruptive. Let's get the conversations going. We need to write Ugandan stories for the world to see, as opposed to, I saw this Nigerian film, I'm going to duplicate it, and I hope that my film passes or just wins at one festival. You know, my dream is to actually win an Oscar with a film in Luganda because the South Koreans did it. Why not? me? Why not another Ugandan producer? Why not us? I mean, we like to put ourselves down. That's seriously one of the challenges I have. And also just never really um, pushing ourselves. As creatives, we are chaos. We don't fit in the boxes. We are a strange breed to the normal person. But we are being forced by society to put ourselves in the box as opposed to forcing society to look outside the box so they understand what we're trying to do. Ugandan filmmaking is a new voice. Visual media is the new voice for the next generation. As soon as you get a script, your locations are key. They are key. Because when we normally are creating a story, the environment is what brings it to life. So if you compromise an environment and take a safe environment, you're already compromising the story, you're compromising the cast, you're compromising your message to your viewers. Because now you've taken a story that could be done in a remote location and you've put it in an urban setting simply because it makes financial sense. I always find that locations are what takes the viewer on the journey with you. So when you get that script, please sit down. Please sit down in your head and say, which part of Uganda do I want to showcase? It is important that we start thinking outside the box. Even the villages we come in have a pulse. They have a heart. We tell stories based on the environment. I cannot stress enough. Um, for example, when I get a script, I like to first travel. Um, I'm lucky enough that I have an old Primo that I've had since I was 18 that doesn't really take a lot of fuel. It's beat up, it's nice and comfortable, but I can go to Kabare for what, 150K going and 150K back. If you cannot afford that, take a taxi with your team choose multiple locations, please sit down and really ask, how do I bring this story to life? Um, and locations are key, locations are key. I cannot stress that enough. So stop compromising and saying, you know what? I can do it in my house. What I will do, I will use this bedroom and that bedroom, what we don't understand is the viewer can tell when content has been shot in the same environment. It doesn't matter how many times you change the room, the colors, the setting, it's a movement and the way the cast feel when they're in that house because the cast member that's playing in these different environments, you'll tell from their body language that they've been here before, that they are actually in the same space. So let's be really, really, really aware of our locations, extremely aware. As a producer, you need to be very aware um, that your crew and your cast feel most safe and most comfortable when they have contracts. They might not be enforceable as we speak today in Uganda's uh, laws and copyright laws and IPR laws. By IPR, I mean intellectual property right laws. Um, but you must give your crew a contract so that they, are under they understand that you have an obligation to meet whatever is sitting in there and that they also have an obligation to meet whatever they said that they would. A contract is not only an enforcement of uh, your needs and wants from your side, but also the crew needs to be able to enforce uh, 
what you told them that they were getting. Like I always say, I have these difficult conversations, but these difficult conversations must be had when the contract is ready. It is important that you sit down, read your contract, understand the implications of you signing that contract, understand the deliverables, and walk away if you must, stay if you can deliver. For CAST, um, I've had horror stories where people sign contracts and they're not enforceable at the end of the day because the producer decides they're not going to pay that particular CAST member. I think that with a, a, a contract, you can either decide to sue the person or walk away. Let's call it, it gives you choices, but it also gives you safety. So as a producer, it is your, in your best interest to get your crew to sign and your cast to sign so that if they're also not delivering, you have a leg to stand on. You can actually say, I am firing you because of A, B, C, and D, and actually have it in a clause. That's all I can say. I mean, like I said, the environment we're sitting in right now, contracts are iffy, but they are required because you never know where that production is going. I have seen productions produced here that end up on huge channels. And then all of a sudden, the cast is coming back to you as a producer and saying, I want some money. But if you sign that contract and the cast member is aware that it doesn't matter where that production is going, they have been paid, then it's also literally protecting yourself. And also the cast member understanding that it doesn't matter, but they have no claim on your production. Cult Productions in Uganda. Mm. Okay, so if you're doing cult productions in Uganda, I go back to paperwork. And I cannot stress that enough because different production companies come with different strengths. And as a production company, I guarantee you, you cannot cover everything. By everything, I mean you will find that uh, certain production companies have access to equipment. They have access to locations. They have access to different things. Other production companies bring the script. They bring the cast and they bring the crew. Other production companies will bring uh, departments that nobody's aware of, like welfare, logistics, the simple things, security that we don't really think about. For us, we have very basic ways of producing, but co-productions give you a chance to cover every facet of a production. However, expectations and deliverables are key and they must be enforced. Please, when you're doing a co-production, do not just sign an MOU. You need to have that co-production agreement notarized by a lawyer so that when things go wrong, you can at least have a claim on something. Also, when we do productions and they excel, our egos kick in. They kick in. People start claiming things that weren't theirs or they were not part of. So it is important that everyone is aware of what's expected on them, what they have to deliver, and how much claim they have on that co-production. Otherwise, it's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> When a co-production actually goes wrong, one thing you must do and always do is sit down first before you start threatening anyone, before you decide to go on social media and make comments that will damage not only your reputation, but the production in itself. In that, okay, you might have an award-winning production, but then you get to the end to sell it. I've seen uh, companies walk away from deals because they're squabbles over who owns what. So you all lose out. So it is important that you sit down, put your egos to the side and think about what can we get out of it? What did we invest in it? And am I okay with this? If that goes wrong, 
if, if that also cannot be part of it, then you need to get lawyers involved and get into mediation first before we start suing. I've seen letters just go across everywhere, people threatening everyone. This is a small industry. Trust me, the person you threaten today, you will have to work with tomorrow. And as creatives, we are highly emotional. I don't know a single creative. I know a few that are very emotionally balanced, but those normally are the DOPs. Uh, because they actually listen to everyone shouting at them. But the producers, the creatives, the actors, the wardrobe people, oh my God. If you put us on a table to solve a problem, I guarantee you we would be here for at least five years. Five years. I think we could do it in 10 years, earliest. I'm not a big fan of grants simply because grants come with expectations and they will stifle your creativity. However, I would not be one to say do not go for those grants. Basically, I live by the credo that nothing in life is free. So when you get a grant, it's always under certain stipulations, which will limit how far you can go with a topic, how far you can explore that topic, um, the grantor's interests, and how soon you can deliver it. As a creative, I find it very difficult, very difficult when I'm under someone's supervision to actually bring my vision to life. However, if you're an emerging filmmaker and you want to get your work seen, and you want to get your crew visibility, please apply for those grants. But be very comfortable and please read the fine print, the clauses they put at the bottom. We have a reputation in Uganda, and I'll tell you this over a conversation I was having with someone that comes from one of the big companies, saying that Uganda uh, uptake of content is very little. We are very small for them to invest in. And I had a comment for that person that got them thinking. I said, you know, we're living in a world right now without boundaries. If content is good, if I make a film out of Uganda that is good, it will be consumed on the continent, it will be consumed globally, it will be consumed in South America with subtitles. It's no longer about where something is made. It's about how good it has been done. So take those grants, please, and do what you have to do. But please, please, please read the fine print, read the terms and conditions, understand them, and then also understand that you need to have accountability because we do have a problem with paperwork. It is important to have a miscellaneous budget because, again, it's like I like to tell people we're living in an industry where the landscape has no proven formula. Here, just because your first production actually went well doesn't mean your second will go well, doesn't mean your third will go well. Having a miscellaneous budget gives you that soft cushion to actually take care of the issues that might arise without you actually uh, projecting for them. It is important that the production goes on, even when things are coming at you in a way you never foresaw. Imagine shooting in a location where the beauty is fantastic, everything is great, but like I said, when it gets to power sources, you're running into running cables and cables of electrical wire just to tap into an electrical source so you can get light. Miscellaneous budgets, however much we don't like to include them, are a necessary evil in a landscape that has no proven production formula. So please... Do not be afraid to include that 10%, that 20%, and also understand these days that that tax that URA is now taxing us on is important because you might be signing contracts with your crews and your casts, not understanding that you need to pay the 6%, you never budgeted for it. That miscellaneous budget is your little piggy bank, I would call it. Having insurance uh, on set on a production from pre-production to production to post-production is extremely key because, again, we don't know what we're dealing with. Uh, we have 
supposedly security on set, but you never envision because we don't have a documented database for cast and crew. You don't know who you're working with. By documented database, I'm talking about a governing body that has everyone's details that comes on your set. We tend to work with people that we have heard of, that we've been told are fantastic to work with. However, we normally never ask for ID. We don't add, we don't do security backgrounds and we're bringing these people into a space that contains our equipment. Uh, but also we don't do health checks on our cast and crew members. And I'm not saying that's recommended, but it is important because when someone comes on your set, they're your responsibility. So imagine someone having a heart attack. People are getting health issues earlier and earlier in life. People, um, we live in a malaria, um, zone, right? We also, there's issues like COVID-19 that have just gone on. There's the Ebola's. These are things we're not taking into account that can hold production and cost you millions of shillings. You can lose equipment for whatever reason. Um, I've seen on sets where people, when a camera is moving on my set, I halt everyone's movement simply because I cannot afford to replace a red I cannot, but I can afford to replace my wardrobe person by bringing in a new one. So when I say, please hold for camera and you keep moving, I have a general rule on my set to tell you three times. By the third time, the other person that's replacing you is coming from wherever they're coming. And uh, we tend to pay you in full, but you don't get the credit. It gets transferred to someone else. So insurance is key simply because you must protect yourself as a producer. I've been in a situation where I lost everything. I lost the content. I lost the equipment. I lost some, so much on a huge project that I would never, ever operate again without insurance. When I say get insurance, I want to reference a project, one of my first projects ever in this country. It was called Beneath the Lies. I wrote it, I uh, produced it, I sort of directed it, I did the casting, I did, I did a lot. And um, I invested so much money with my partner at the time, Cedric Ndilima, and we, we, we basically foresaw, we had a vision and it was being executed beautifully. At the end of having 13 episodes and investing millions of shillings into what I consider one of the biggest groundbreaking projects in this country, we lost it all. And having to face the public and say, this is what happened, there's an element of disbelief. The conspiracy theories were a lot. Basically, first of all, you're coping with depression from losing so much. And now you have to listen to people judge you and say whatever they want about you without really understanding the facts. Now, in hindsight, if I had had insurance, we would have just restarted the whole project. We would have just gone back to the drawing board and restarted the whole project because we would have had a safety net. But what we did after not speaking and filing numerous police reports. <laughs> we filed police reports, dude, okay, they were a lot. What we did, we decided that every day we would put aside 20,000 Uganda shillings in a basket for a year. And whatever was in that basket, we would use to shoot as many episodes as we could. And we shot six episodes with what we had and we wrapped beneath the lies. But the irony of life is those six episodes went on to actually compete as the best series on the continent at the AMVCAs along with the Nigerians and the South Africans. But this is a tidbit nobody knew. I was in Lagos and Aiki, who was the presenter at the time, said, oh, and Beneath the Lies from Uganda. Then you say, no, it can't be. It must be Ghana, because the person on here is Nana. That was it that credit was taken away from us as Uganda because he didn't go back and look at it again. But we're coming back. Beneath the Lies is coming back. In post-production, it is extremely key that you choose an excellent editor. And the editor might not be excellent, but they have to be able to listen to you, to listen to your vision. They have to understand from the get-go what you're trying to achieve. So I tend to involve my editor in the pre-production, 
in the production and in the post-production. My editor comes with us at every production, simply because when I'm calling the shots, he needs to be on set. Right now in the industry in Uganda, we don't have the capability to do multiple shots in our own time, to do B-rolls, to, you know, to, to do those little things that matter when the editor is getting it, that they can pick from this angle and that angle. We don't have that. So I normally have my editor on set. Of course, they're paid to be there in pre-production and production and post-production. But what that does, he also will flag some of the shots that I'm doing that he might not be able to use because of certain reasons. So I tend to involve my editor in that. Now, he also has to stay in an, in an environment I can control security-wise. So the editor actually has to stay in accommodation that is a place that you can control as a producer, because as soon as you give them access to your content that is actually on a drive, on the cloud, or whatever it is, anything can happen to it because it's an uncontrolled environment. You can't blame them if they say my house was broken into, my computer was stolen, the drive was stolen. All these are issues that can actually arise because we're human, these things happen. So what one needs to do is identify a place where you can set up for them, where they're comfortable, when you can, where you can feed them, you can basically house them, they can actually work work on your content like a hundred percent where they're not running multiple projects and just getting back to your project whenever they get a minute. Also agree on a fee. And I like to pay my editors 50% at the inception so that I lock you in. And then I start giving you 10%, another 10% and maybe 30% on delivery. But at the same time, you need to keep them happy. Please keep your editors happy. Also sound design. I cannot stress enough how important sound design is. It is important that your sound designer understand the mood, the project, the emotions you're trying to evoke out of the viewer. They need to understand the content that you have produced. It is key because we tend to think as long as I have a beautiful soundtrack, that's it. No, does your music connect to what you have shot? Does it draw in the viewer? Does it evoke that emotion? Because as human beings, we tend to connect emotions to music. So get a great sound designer. Also have them sit with the editor. Also, I cannot say graphics needs to be dismissed. Graphics is also key on how beautiful your picture looks and how those credits roll across. We tend to think, you know what? I have a template, it will just run, I'll just go in and just keep changing names. Please don't do that. Also, if your content is in a local language, the presumption we have as Ugandans, especially Uganda, is we think everyone speaks our language. Take the time to do the subtitles. It doesn't matter. Even those that actually speak fluent Luganda might not understand some of the things that are being said. And if you want to shoot content in proper Luganda, sometimes we have to go back. I don't even understand. Like, I just finished a project and we had an actor who speaks Luganda on 2.0. Even I who had written it was like, Okay, we're going to have to subtitle that. But it was beautiful to listen to him talk. So literally engage people to do subtitles and let them be in beautiful graphics. So someone is drawn to the font, someone is drawn to the screen and someone wants to really read. Also, color grading. Your editor will not color grade for you. Please do not ask the editor to color grade. Editors are normally very good, but they can't do it all. Get someone who actually is a great color grader, especially on black skin, because we tend to shoot in exteriors and they are very complicated when you're shooting at 12 noon in Ugandan sun like it is right now. Please don't do it, please don't, because we tend to look ashy despite the makeup job's best, best efforts. So those key things, like there are four, there's the editor, there's the sound design, there's the graphics, and there's the color grading. Please don't compromise on those in post. Please, please invest in your artwork. We as human beings are drawn to beautiful things. 
Whether they're beautiful or sad, we like to try and understand why something's so beautiful, why something is so tragic, why something draws us to that. And please try to use a face, not numerous faces. We like the safety net of about 10 people on, on a poster. As soon as you do that, I am overwhelmed on who to focus on. So please pick something simple, but beautiful and well thought out and really, really has the image of what you want your production to tell the world. Please invest in posters, invest in graphic work, invest in artwork. Take the time to look at it. Take the time to sit with your artwork. We like to do artwork very quickly. We realize we need a poster. So you get someone who can actually go on uh, Canva. There's, there's that, um, that, that app called Canva. And we generate something generic. And then you wonder why people are not drawn to wanting to know more about your film. Please, when someone does your artwork, sit with it. I always take about 72 hours with my artwork. Then I start sending it to people that I trust. One of those is my mother. She pulls no punches. She'll let me know, be no be cheap. Like, it's also important that you open yourself up to negative criticism, but it's also important that you believe that if you believe that is the artwork, do it. It's always better to have negative engagement than nothing at all. So please take the time, sit with it, really think about it, get it done by a professional. We don't like to pay professionals, but everyone is skilled in whatever they're, dis whatever they're skilled in for a purpose. Use them, utilize them. If you can't pay them, sit with them, make a bargain. This industry sometimes requires that you are transparent, that you talk to people. Creative, sometimes we just want to create. And as much as money is a key factor in all our lives, if you are Talking to someone from your heart, they tend to see the truth in what you're saying. It is important to have a successful premiere because first of all, everyone gets to dress up. I'm talking about your crew and your cast. It is important that they feel beautiful, that they feel rewarded, that they're celebrated. I think that a premiere is just not uh, for the people that you're inviting to see your work, but that you're celebrating the people that actually delivered that. It is important that when you invite people to come and view whatever you've done, that your premiere is well thought out. Whether you want it to be a gala celebration or a small intimate setting, please take the time to put together your premiere. Now, I want to make a recommendation to all producers out there, to all filmmakers out there, please don't charge for premieres. Please do not charge for premieres if you can avoid it because it takes away from people wanting to come and celebrate you. It takes away from people really viewing your work and talking about it in a setting that will generate enough interest that when people talk about it, you will get money from people viewing it. But charging for premieres leaves a bad taste in every creative's mouth. If you're doing it at a cinema, please see if you can mobilize financial help before you ask people to pay. I, I find myself um, as a producer and as a filmmaker um, wanting to go to premieres, but the fact that I'm being charged 50,000 shillings and yet I also have to invest in myself to turn up and I'm, I'm not complaining but it does leave a bad taste. I, I, I find that globally nobody charges for premieres apart from us and it's not doing our industry any favor so it's important that we have successful premieres but they don't have to be on a large scale. Please, if I am inviting you Jimmy, I would prefer to say it's invitation only and then have people really want to know why is this person being invited and, and, and let people feel special for being the first people to see your production. Festivals are important on a producer's journey because most festivals have cash prizes, okay? 
And those cash prizes as producers enable us to invest into other projects. They also get you noticed for co-productions, whether they're global, whether they're you know regional, and your work gets seen and you get celebrated. It also is a networking issue. Festivals are a networking thing, but we tend to be very wary when there's a fee attached to a festival. Please don't get discouraged by that. Please involve yourself in as many festivals as you can. It is imperative that you understand who you're competing with regionally and globally. So please, as a producer, make time, go to festivals, understand who's doing what, what is being celebrated. How can I um, involve myself in this particular arena? How can I be on these panels? How can I get my voice heard? How can I get my content seen? Um, festivals are are basically a great place to network, connect, uh, see who's doing what, and just basically be heard. I like to be heard. It is important to uh, think about distribution and marketing first, because A, you need to understand the demographic that you're making your film for. In Uganda, as filmmakers, I have asked many a people that have brought me scripts and I say to them, who are you targeting? Where is your film going? Why this particular topic? And I keep getting the same answer because this happened to me and this happened to me. So I wrote a script about it because I wanted to tell the world my story. Unfortunately for me, that's not good enough. It's not good enough at all because if this happened to you, then you're writing it for two reasons. It's either therapy or you want the world to hear your story. To what end? I don't know. But we need to be aware of what's selling, what content is out there and who is consuming it. So understanding your strength as a filmmaker, you know, the demographic you're producing for. I mean, at my age, I find it very difficult to produce for teenagers because I haven't been in the teenage space for, whoo! <laughs> I haven't been in the teenage space or the 20 something space for a very long time. So please produce material that you can identify with, that you're current with, that is now I can actually produce a great film about divorce, right? I've been divorced twice. Uh, I can write a really great film about that. I can write a great film about women issues, but understand who you're writing for the demographic who's going to consume it, who you can actually approach. And they would say, please, please give me your content. Another thing when you're negotiating, please don't be apologetic for asking for what you feel you're worth. Some people will walk away from the table. That's okay. That's really okay because they're not the ones for you. And as much as that um, song has been sung, it is true. I have walked away from deals where I walk out of the door and I want to throw up because I think about what I could have used that money for and I walked away. But it always, always works out. So when you're negotiating, A, understand what you invested in that business. B, Understand which platform you want to be on. There's this whole conception of Netflix, Amazon, Sh Showmax. What people don't understand that the algorithm for these networks will, your film will get lost in translation where you cannot find it. Even if it's sitting on Netflix, even if it's sitting on Amazon, if you're not getting visibility, whether they commission it or not, it doesn't matter. That means you sold an IPR, you sold your idea to someone for money, but you'll never be seen because it's lost in all this African content where it's been buried by the algorithm somewhere. So understand where you want to be, who you want want to see who you are and who you want to become and negotiate accordingly, please. We are under siege with uh, these pay-per-view companies that are actually walking up to producers and negotiating below rate commissions. And we are giving in and we're sitting there and we're now like people are stuck in financial crisis trying to deliver content that could possibly be groundbreaking. But because of financial constraints and really badly put together contracts, we are suffering and the industry as a whole is paying the price.
So the journey of footage is crucial. And as producers, we never really think about it. We think, okay, I've done my, my content. It's sitting on uh, a camera. It's sitting on a card. Uh, I, I'm just going to literally keep going until we are tired. Then I would basically giving it to whoever the dumper is on set. And that's that. And then they can download it. And I don't have to have a backup drive. Ladies and gentlemen in the film industry, the f journey of footage is something that is sacred. That's the word I want to use. It's sacred. Um, one needs to have, and I'm going to say this because hard drives sometimes cost like 300, 350, okay? In your budget, please allocate 2 million Uganda shillings minimum for the safety of your footage because if you don't have footage, you have nothing. We tend to dismiss the importance of handling footage like you handle a newborn. OK, it really is important that you understand that you must allocate the safety of your footage to someone who is accountable to you. That is just there to make sure that every four to six hours, that's for me, my safety net is four to six hours, that that footage is basically downloaded and then uploaded onto a cloud. When I say you have four hard drives or three hard drives, that's minimum three hard drives. I tend to use four. They're all in different places. And whoever has to deliver footage to wherever they need to go, there is a car. It seems like such a frivolous expenditure to say that my footage must be in a car. Simply because the person that has that particular footage at that time has your entire production in their hands. If you can think about it that way, you will understand why you need to actually be vigilant. The cloud is also a beautiful thing. It costs money, but everything that is of value costs money. So one needs to weigh the value of your footage to the money you're putting towards it. Have a dumper on set. Have your editor on set. Talk to your DOP. Tell them how much footage do we have now? Can we format? Can we? Oh my God. I, I, I'm so passionate about the journey of footage. And when I was asked to talk about it, I think we need to be here for an hour, but I don't think I'll be allowed that because it's, it's something, it, it, it the journey of footage, it would take half a day for me to explain the whys and the wheres and how you have to do that. But like I said, when you treat it like a newborn, just imagine um, handling that baby in your hands and then you decide to throw them on the floor or wherever it is or put them in a backpack and think about it. Oh, and another thing, normally when we rap, people even go out at rap parties with that footage in a backpack. It's absolutely crazy. As a producer, your footage is everything. I'm not going to tell you how to get it done, but three hard drives, different places, the cloud, have a dumper on site, have the editor on site. Please allocate someone who I like to call security. I even give them a t-shirt so they feel important. And their job is to make sure that that particular hard drive has gotten to this person, has gotten to that person. The footage has been uploaded to the cloud. And then also, when you're done shooting, Please, if you can afford to, personally, I allocate a hard drive to each project and I do not delete the raw footage for two years because that's how much licensing contracts normally are. And you don't know which distributor is going to ask you to change that particular final format to suit their needs. And to be totally honest, I think a Ugandan producer can only do about two features a year max, and that's when you're pushing it. So why not allocate a hard drive for two years to that particular project? And that particular project should have another three backups. And I'm, it's, it's, it's sad to think about, but it is. And unfortunately, we don't have data banks here where one can actually basically just walk in and say, please archive this. But please... Your footage is your entire life.